everyone, welcome back for part two, the build. So the first step in building this diversion safe is obviously buying a thermos. This particular model is the Stanley Classic 2-quart version. This bigger version allows for fully concealing equipment using the maximum space available. But the actual first step in building the thermos diversion safe is safety. Although you cannot see me, I am wearing safety goggles and hearing protection for this project. This is no joke, as we will be dealing with very dangerous stuff. And since I don't want to have a stick shoved up my nose or get entered into a database, it will be wise to be overly cautious so as to avoid a trip to the hospital. So the absolute most difficult part of this entire project we're going to do first. And the hard part is getting this end cap off. Now at the factory this is put on there with a fair amount of force with using a press of some kind, some kind of hydraulic press. So to get it off is, is kind of a, a, a difficult thing to do. But the actual way that has worked the most for most of the thermoses we've actually done uh, has been using heat. So the first step is to drill holes in or a small hole in the actual body of the thermos. And this does a couple of things. For one, it turns your vacuum bottle into a natural ambient air bottle because it's no longer uh, under a vacuum, so we're repressurizing that container. Anytime you're using heat or any kind of construction or building something, you don't want to have to deal with any sort of uh, potential explosive behavior, right? Uh, and also, likewise, we drill a small hole in the very bottom of the thermos as well. <laughs> And this is why we're drilling that hole in the bottom of the end cap. As you can see here, uh, we're skipping forward a few steps uh, because it was very hard for me to actually film this uh, while doing it. You'll notice that the uh, actual end cap is not the final cap, right? There's actually this, this other little bit of hardware that goes in between the actual end cap and the rest of the bottle. That's, that's the bottom of the actual container, and that's how the uh, Stanley bottle has the air evacuated from it so that it's a true vacuum bottle. But this is a very much a hazard because if you use a blowtorch to heat up the end cap to remove it and get rid of all that glue and gunk and stuff, uh, if you get rid of that, using a blowtorch, then you have the potential to create uh, explosive results, which we do not want. So drilling a small hole in the bottom of the end cap and repressurizing the container uh, by getting rid of the vacuum part of the bottle, that will ensure that it is the safest you could possibly be. Otherwise, you're going to have some, you're going you're to have some problems. Once you heat up uh, the, around the edge with the blowtorch, you should be able to monkey with it a little bit and get it to come off. Now, like I mentioned, this is the most difficult part of the whole operation. You might have to have a buddy come and help you uh, pull that bad boy off, and you might have to use a screwdriver to kind of lightly pry it off a little bit um, without damaging it. But once you get it off, uh, it's smooth sailing for the rest of the way, for the most part. So the next step after you get the actual cap off is to use a stack of books or some other kind of mechanism for creating a straight line. And this is where we're drawing the line on this particular bottle, just above, uh, if you're looking at it the right way up, just above the Stanley label, because we want to preserve that actual Stanley label to make it look a little bit more authentic when it's done. And, you know, we're just kind of eyeballing it here. It doesn't need to be specific or precise. This is about three quarters of an inch from the shoulder of the bottle there, as you can see. And then once we get that mark, we can go ahead and cut that bottle part. So as you can see here, I'm using a Dremel tool, and once you cut all the way around it, then you now have the inside of the bottle. So this is the actual part that holds the liquid, and this is the part that we're going to be cutting, cutting away to shorten it. Now that hollow cavity that I'm setting over there off to the side, that is the uh, part that's going to hold uh, the actual equipment that we're going to be storing inside this. And once again, we're going to repeat the process using our marker just just slightly above the actual mark that we made before so that it's a little easier to, to do. And you'll see once I start cutting it here um, how it actually all works. As you can see here on this particular one, I decided to cut it a little bit further down. Um, I would recommend cutting it a little bit further up because you can't quite see it with your eye, but the bottle is actually tapered just so slightly. So when you cut the bottom of this container off, it's going to not fit unless you actually cut pretty close up to the shoulder of the bottle. It's going to be too wide. Um, and it's not going to work. For some reason, this particular length worked quite well, but on another one, this is the other one I did, it didn't work at all, and I had to end up cutting basically at the same level as the outside, uh, outside layer. So once you end up cutting this, this will fit perfectly. As you can see there, I tried all kinds of mechanisms, grinding it down to get it to fit. It did not work. But if you do it right the first time, you will not have to do what I'm doing here and cutting a second time. 
All right, so once you made, you've made all of your major cuts and you've got uh, got everything all cut apart that you need, uh, you can grind that down a little bit so that it's not so sharp. This, for one, prevents you from getting little cuts, and also it, it allows it to stick together a little bit better uh, just by dulling those sharp points down. So as you can see, I forgot to film it, but I went ahead and cut the bottom of the interior uh, container and that is it fitted on to the actual container. So as you can see all we're doing is cutting out the guts, the middle part of that center container that actually holds the liquid and we are making it fit uh, right up there at the very top so that it can only hold a very small amount of liquid. And as you can see if you get the cutting part just right the first time it is a perfect fit. So we're going to actually attach this now. And as you can see, we're, we're using JB Weld as our favorite, favorite adhesive for this. This is going to weld the actual container shut so that it remains watertight because JB Weld is, of course, waterproof once it is dried and cured. And it functions much the same as an actual weld, especially for light use applications like this. So this will work just fine for us. And as you can see here, I'm using quite a bit uh, because I don't actually know how much I will need. It's a little bit different every Every time um, so I just use a, a good amount that looks like a, a maybe a tablespoon and that and that ended up being uh, a little bit too much but if you wanted to start with a tablespoon of both the um, actual JB weld itself and the hardener uh, a tablespoon of each roughly that will give you plenty to work with you never want to uh, mix up uh, too little when it comes to adhesives or glues that are two parts you always want to make sure that you've got plenty so that it doesn't uh, doesn't harden up on you while you are putting it together. So we're going to mix these two together in classic JB Weld form. Everybody knows how to use JB Weld. And once we get it to a nice good consistency, we're going to start applying it to the actual uh, bottom of the container. Now this is how I chose to put it on the inside. You could do it another way. Um, this way is slightly messy. And as you can see, I forgot to mention that you should always use latex gloves when using JB Weld because it will stick to you. And I, like an idiot, did not. I forgot to put on the latex gloves this time and I ended up with sticky hands. So make sure that you do that. Uh, especially when this particular job is not going to be uh, exactly non-messy. It's going to be a very messy job. So once you've got it all on there, you can uh, use a uh, tongue depressor, in, in my case, to smooth it around and make sure that it's, it's as uniform as possible. Remember, we're not really going for uh, grade A work here. We're going for what works. So uh, as you can see here, we're sticking it right on there. Give it a slight a little bit of a wiggle and a little bit of a, a quarter of a turn and make sure it's seated just fine and that will cure uh, for the amount of time for JB Weld. I gave it a full day just to make absolutely certain a full 24 hours that it is in fact bonded together uh, just in case I didn't get any, everything quite mixed up together. So once your JB Weld is hardened, you can uh, switch over to the epoxy fill. Now this epoxy fill is going to do a couple of, a couple of things. For one, it's going to insulate uh, the um, inside of the container just a little bit so, that, so as to protect uh, your equipment on the inside from radical temperature changes such as putting a hot beverage in the top part of the container. Also, it's going to add a considerable amount of strength because as you can see here, we have cut away uh, and limited a lot of the structural integrity of the bottle itself. So what we're going to do is line it back up to where we cut it apart. Uh, it's not going to be perfect, but if you, you might have to grind a little bit here and there, but in my case it worked out quite, quite well. There's only a very small gap, maybe less than sixteenth of an inch, just a hair gap uh, around the edge. And what we're doing here is I'm using the tape that I had handy that day, which in this case was Gorilla Tape. Uh, classic one inch Gorilla Tape and I'm taping around the edge so as to prevent the epoxy from flowing out. Now in hindsight, uh, I did not know it while filming this, but this is not really a great choice uh, because even though Gorilla Tape is waterproof, um, it's not really great for epoxy because the epoxy tended to um, interact with the adhesive uh, from the Gorilla Tape. So I ended up using a lot of painter's tape which you will see in a minute. But here we are mixing up the actual epoxy. The particular epoxy I used is just the cheapest stuff I could possibly find on Amazon, and this was a 16 ounce kit. And as you can see here, I'm trying to use uh, roughly 75% of each container. Um, I actually ended up using all, uh, both containers, the entirety of both containers, uh, when it comes to mixing this epoxy, uh, because I didn't have quite enough, and I wanted to make sure I overfilled it rather than underfilled it. So I ended up using uh, both containers 
um, together. So mixing it up, making sure it's nice and mixed, and there we are pouring it into the bottom of the container. Now, like I said, this adds a nice little layer in there to prevent bumping and scratching and things like that, and it also makes the uh, joint very, very strong. Now, one thing to keep in mind is if you end up putting hot liquids in this, most epoxies will start to soften around 165 degrees which is well within the range of a hot you know, cup of water that, or coffee or whatever you're putting inside the actual thermos part. So keep that in mind is if you end up using a lot of hot liquids in this thing all the time, you might want to get a heat sensitive epoxy. And here we go once it's dry 24 hours later. And, I, and actually in my case, it took uh, two days to dry because this epoxy was not very high quality. Um, you can remove the tape and start um, peeling away some of the ex excess epoxy that may have leaked a little bit. Once we've got things all smoothed out, we have to address the quite obvious elephant in the room, this seam right here. Now you can just leave it like it is, and most people won't notice it at all. But remember, we want to make this as camouflaged as possible. So we went on the internet and ordered a bunch of random stickers. In this case, we chose a hiking slash outdoor themed sticker pack to make this bottle look like it belongs to a hipster or something. This is important because we don't want this bottle to be coated with stickers that say Glock or Smith & Wesson or anything that remotely seems related to firearms. Most companies in the firearms and tactical gear community usually ship their products with a sticker or two, but it is important to make sure sure to go out and buy some stickers that aren't conspicuous with which to cover up the seam. And finally, we can turn to our closure method. Now for us, we've tried out a few different methods of closing this container, but the one that is easiest to replicate and the easiest for most people to do is the simple press fit method. As you can see here, we had a bit of an issue filming this part because we had to make these cuts in a location that is not very conducive to filming, but you get the gist. These cuts allow the bottom lips to flex, and this alone provides a a friction to grip that pesky silver end cap. These cuts are definitely needed because this end cap will not come off unless you have them. It's just too strong of a bond. On this particular prototype bottle, we fitted a very strong magnet to the inside of the end cap. This allows for a very specific use of being able to use a piece of metal or steel or something to pull off the end cap in a hurry. In retrospect, this feature isn't necessary or really all that useful, but I did want to show it just in case anybody was wondering. And that's it. That's the basic build of the Stanley Vacuum Bottle Diversion Safe. As you can see, the uses of something like this are endless, and if you shop around, you will probably find other double-walled vacuum bottles that this technique could work very well with. There are lots of cheap double-walled water bottles on the market nowadays, so this is something that you can by all means experiment with to create your own custom equipment. So let us know what you think of this setup, and if you have any ideas for improvement, let us know in the comments section below. Also, make sure to check out our other platforms and resources in the description box below. And finally, a special thank you to our Patreon supporters who make content like this possible. And with that, we will see you next time. And always remember to fight in the shade. Or in this case, the potting shed.